forward to it too. I was just telling Laura that it is the only day of the week I wash my hair. Did you want to know that? All I'm saying is my hair looks better only on Mondays. Tuesdays, it's still decent. Wednesdays, by Friday, you don't want to leave the house. By Saturday, I'm wearing a hat. By Sunday, I'm wearing a hat and a pillowcase. It's not a good look. But Oxford, Pennsylvania, woohoo! Oh, this is so nice. Sharon, Diana, thank you all for being here. I really, really appreciate it. I really do. And I'm going to like, I won't vamp for a long time because all the dogs are fine, but they're asleep. So God forbid we wake them up. But also there's a lot to get to tonight and an announcement and secret things and giveaways. So I'm going to kind of like wrap this up and we will go right into the, uh, the little video and start it up. So go for it and I'll vamp till it comes on. But it's going to be, oh, someone's talking about my hair. That's that's really all I care about, my hair. And there is gray showing, but don't look. Sally, who has won a prize in the past. Sally Davis, thank you for being here. Oh, you, Garnet Valley, beautiful place. Howdy from St. Louis. What, what? I go to the St. Louis Library a million times. I love it so much. Chester Springs, oh, I've heard of that. Oh, what a beautiful pic. Oh, 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 I'll shut up. Here we go. Okay, be ready, be ready. We're in the convent of Santa Caterina in Palermo, which is a really beautiful cloistered convent that is now open to the public. And it existed in the 1800s because convent life was very important. And obviously religion was really important in Palermo. And the nuns here were mostly children of nobility or children of wealthier families. But what's really interesting for these purposes, which is carbohydrates, is that the nuns did a lot of baking and they baked for everybody in the city. You could buy their baked goods and they would sell them and give the proceeds to orphanages and to the poor. And today, all of those recipes are available. They're really delicious here. They're selling it. You can taste it yourself. Um, it's made with uh, pistachio and almond and marzipan and chocolate and lemon and all fresh lemons since lemons and mandarin oranges are uh, grown in Sicily and in Palermo. So it's really sort of a remarkable place. You can see the second deck, these beautiful windows, and then up above the bell tower. Really a remarkable place. So what this episode is about is this amazing place that I went to called the, the Convent of St. Cantarina. Now that's the American version of talking about it because I'm not going to inflict my horrible Italian accent on you. And it's in Piazza Bellini in Palermo. Now last week I said to you, what's the most, what's the most interesting thing you learned in research? And we talked about the Beati Paoli, this secret, real secret society of do-gooders in Palermo that fought the mafia as it was beginning. Well, the second most important thing I learned is this cool stuff about this convent. And it features into loyalty, which I'm not going to give anything away. But there's a character that you'll see brings this to life. Because what is so cool about this convent, let me back up and give you some history. If you remember, we've talked before about the Spanish Inquisition and the religions on Sicily. Sicily had been home to Judaism, uh, there, there, there were mosques, there were Muslims, there were Catholics, there were all kinds of religions. But when the Inquisition came along, Jews were expelled from the island, any Muslims were too. And the only religion left was Roman Catholicism. That was the only religion you were allowed. So convents were sprang up, right? Here's a picture of the front of this convent. Now, what I want to show you is that, this is great, I can't find the picture. Things are going really well. All right. The thing is, not everybody who went to the convent, obviously it's young girls, daughters of society. P many of them were called to the convent as a religious calling, but some were not. Because when you go back to the customs of the times in the 1800s, what it was is daughters of nobility, it was a sign of prestige to have your child in a convent. And the, the 
options to women in this time were very, very few. In loyalty, I have a character like that who was in a convent. I won't give too much away, but here's the books to see what we're talking about, give you some framework. And I, what I started to understand was the women's lives were very interior, right? They, they really weren't supposed to go out during the day. Um, they certainly were they regarded as property. They, they had no rights of their own. And there was enormous sexism, obviously. And so the, the, and so when you even look at the, the state of the convent, it was a cloistered convent. And this convent of St. Caterina was one of the most famous in Palermo at the time. And so daughters, here's the front. Here's what it looks like. Here's the front of it. Here's the cathedral. There's a church next to it. And the convent is right there. It's on the piazza. And you can walk up to it. And what they've done is kept it open. And you can tour it. And so that is really cool. And what's really cool about it is that they actually sold baked goods there. And that is sort of an interesting idea because the, here's what it looks like inside. You walk through and it's very, very spare as you would expect of a convent. You know, it's not like, not cushy. These are the original floors from the 1800s. These are the arches. They overlook a courtyard, which you saw me standing in. You didn't have to hear me saying dumb stuff. You could notice that my hair was incredibly over lightened, but that happens. I mean, I was like trying to look all sunny now I'm trying to look all gray. It's great. Anyway, so there I was. And this is all this whole thing. If you see when you walk in, this window overlooks this beautiful courtyard and all of the, nun, the nuns little rooms ring the courtyard, and this beautiful fountain, beautiful garden. And what they do is they they make baked goods. Now, they were not unusual in that way. The way it worked back then is so fascinating to me, which is that Ordinary bread was baked in bakeries, and that's all that ordinary bakeries did. They didn't, you didn't go to a bakery for a cake. The only places that were allowed to make pastries, cakes, sweets, mostly lemon-based, as you know, because we've talked about how lemons and limes and citrus grew in the uh, Concadoro, which was the area right around Palermo. Those were made in the convents by the nuns, usually the daughters of nobility. It was very um, fancy and Tony and the pastries they made, believe me, I have pictures for it because it's still, it's still, it is an amazing location, Cynthia. It was a beautiful, beautiful convent and you could walk around it. And so when you tour it, the first thing you see is the big basket at the beginning, which is all their, um, rolling pins. Isn't that so touching? All their rolling pins. And then they have a little display set up of their molds. Here's the molds. They would make different things. And all of the pastries they made, many of them had religious significance. In fact, as you know, or you may not know, because I mentioned it earlier that in another video, that there, 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 religion was so powerful and so strong, and everybody was such a fervent believer. And there was an array of saints, and all of those saints, like Saint Rosalia, whom we've talked about, those each of those saints has a feast day. And that was taken very, very seriously. So there was a pastry made specially for the feast day and available only at certain times of the year and only in the convents. It's really remarkable. Here's a picture of an older picture of one of the nuns. They were Dominican. Here they are making it. And by the way, I'll show you, I'm skipping ahead to show you something cool, which is at this convent, which will still sell the baked goods. They had, they sell a recipe book, which is only in Italian. And it shows the old pictures of this convent, which as I say, there's the room where they would eat. There's the room where they would bake. Um, you can see these incredible things. That's actually, this is a room. This is their visiting room, which I actually put in the loyalty because there's a visitor that comes to the room because there's a great love story in this book and and it's really remarkable here's a picture of the fountain i was standing at from above it's just gorgeous it's a gorgeous place to live and it's a gorgeous contemplative way of life but i wanted to point out that it was lovely and gorgeous but but confining if you were there because you had no other options or because your parents wanted you to be, and there's a lot of information and a lot of research showed that the girls were there, and since they were daughters of nobility, the nobility was expected to make big contributions to the church, to the convent, not only for the for good reasons, the upkeep of the convent, for its good works, for the feeding of the poor. That's part of the reason they made the pastries. They made the pastries for their own upkeep and for the... Um, to take care of the poor. But the whole thing was, 
you know, as a woman, you had very, very few choices then. And I liked the idea, and I think there's a character in this book, Violetta, where you see that um, her choices are, you know, it looks like it's a privileged life, but it's really a gilded cage. And a gilded cage is nonetheless a cage. It's a cage. And so what uh, but I want to show you inside the comment because this is an amazing place and it's not always open. So we got to go there. I want you to get a chance. If you don't get to go, here you go. Here's actually somebody that's not a nun. This is modern day. This is a cannoli station. Okay, it's a convent with the cannoli station. I don't, I don't think it gets better than that. I mean, really. And here's, I'm going to go through these fast because there's a couple of them. But here's a sample of the pastries. These are actually breasts of St. Agatha. It's in this, you know, we talked about how they're, a feast day. Well, St. Agatha is a really important saint in Sicily, and it's the breasts of the Virgin, and they kind of look like breasts. I don't know if you see out the Stanley Tucci thing. He showed you them, too. Let me show you some of these pastries, though, how incredible they look. Here's a cassata antica, which I actually have in loyalty because I it's delicious. It's like a special kind of cake with citrus and sponge and rum, and it's so good. You know what? A lot of Italian wedding cakes have a lot of rum. I didn't like it when I was little. Now I can't get enough. Here's another kind of pastry. I'm going to take you through them. I just spit because I'm actually salivating from the food. What is the matter with me? Um, here's another one. I'm take you through fast so you just get get your little mouth watering. I put as many of these in loyalty as I could because I thought I love this about this very unique thing that who would think that a convent is what makes the pastries. And if you read literature about Sicily, like we talked before about Lampedusa the leopard, you know, he, he eats the lemon cake made by the nuns in the convent. Look at this, of course, right? The lemon slice, you know why. These are unbelievable. Here's some kind of tart. And these were all there. We saw them, you can buy them. We bought them, we ate them. I thought later we should have filmed eating them, but I'm like, you don't need to see me eating more things. Look at this. Here's a kind of a Genovese, a uh, rigot, as my mother would say. It's got ricotta cream there. And here's one with a different kind of cream, probably a lemon cream. I had a margarita, not the drink. It's actually a pastry and it's phenomenal. I crave it right now. It was so good. It's like a lemon curd wrapped in this really delicious pastry. Oh my God, you could die. And here's something that I actually put in the book, Urbanetti, which is, we talked before about how there's so much pistachio in Palermo. And they find a million things to do with pistachio. And one of the things is Urbanetti, which is a pastry made of pistachio. And that's in loyalty too. Here's a better picture of it. So the bakery is still in the convent today, but not run by nuns. Yes, exactly. And look at this. Amazing. That's Urbanetti. It's a pistachio pastry. I got them. I stuck them in my mouth. They're incredible. They're delicious. And I'll show you one other little thing, which is off the point, but is inside the convent. And I thought you might want to see it because I thought it was fascinating. So this convent is a cloistered convent. What does that mean? It means that there's no contact between the nuns and the outside world. There is a visiting area where families could visit, but there was restrictions about which family could visit and when they could visit. And you see the grate. There's a grate between you and your family member if you're a nun. So it's not like you're socializing. And these nuns, though, interestingly, so what if you wanted to buy the pastries, you didn't go walk up to the counter and then see a nun. You would decide what you wanted, and they would put it on a wheel, it was called. The wheel is, like, this, is a, this is the wheel. It's the first thing you see when you walk in the entrance hall of the convent of St. Caterina. And you can see how it works. It's like a turnstile, like a lazy Susan. You, you put your money on it. They whirl it around. And then your pastries come out and you go. So you're not having contact with the nuns and they're not having contact with you. This is how you get your pastry. But what I discovered in my research, which was really interesting and kind of heartbreaking, is that a lot of times when a baby was born, maybe an illegitimate baby or an unwanted baby, and somebody didn't know what to do, they would go to the convent and they would put the baby on the wheel and they would turn it. And then the nuns would take the baby and take care of the baby and raise the baby and figure out what to do with the baby. So the wheel was there for pastries and for something much more heartbreaking. Breaking. And it's just really, um, when I had read about that, I was so touched to see this little small thing. And you can kind of imagine this little, little baby on there and given up and uh, really a heartbreaking thing. 
So that is the convent of St. Caterina. If you look up convent of St. Caterina, you can find their book, which unfortunately is only in Italian. They're big on the, the pastry breasts in the back. And, uh, but you can see all different pictures of it. And I'll put some of my pictures on the website as we get closer to the, um, the thing. But it really, for me, it, for me, making a character who was a nun, who will bring out not only this, the, the great kind of incongruity, incongruity and the irony of having all these delicious, sumptuous, sensual pastries that they're making every, every day, but they go out. The pastries go out. Their life is austere. Their life is prayer and devotion and duty. And they don't enjoy the pastries themselves. They sell the pastries. That austerity contrasted with that abundance and extravagance and enjoyment of a sensual pleasure or just of eating as compared with the lack of pleasures they had, their ascetic existence was something I really wanted to set up. Because I, I think, as I've said before, I like to try to give you my little secrets on these things. And um, I think irony like that has a real wrench in your heart. You're like, ah, I want to be here. No, I don't want to be here. I would love to be here. No, I'd hate to be her. And so I hope that comes through. But that's sort of the secret research behind it that I thought was super, super cool. And if I were going to say the second most interesting thing I learned was about that convent and convents and the baked goods. Somehow it's all about the carbohydrates with me. I can't get over it. Little Lisa has big news. I have been asked by Amazon to write a short story for Amazon Selects, and they are publishing it in ebook and in audio book. And what is the story? This, this is the cover, as it will look at on your little phone or your laptop, and I'll explain more about this in a minute. The story is Pigeon Tony's Last Stand. This is what the cover looks like. Now, let me tell you about this for a minute. You know, many of you know the Rosado and Associates series, and then it was Rosado and Denunzio. It is began with Everywhere That Mary Went. It's my first book ever. I love those women. I miss those women, their families, the Denunzios and the Tonys. I am not ending that series. That series is not going anywhere. I just wanted to take a break to write historical fiction. I'm going to go back to it. I've been missing it. I get a lot of, Sherry, you're so nice. Thank you, Marcy already ordered. I get a lot of email going, I'm sad you ended the series. I'm like, I didn't end the, uh, I, didn't, I didn't end the series. I promise you, I get it. It sucks because I hate waiting to go back to them. But I, I told you, I got this bug in my ear to do this historical stuff. I'll, I'll get it out of my system. But sooner, but then what happened is when Amazon said, do you want to write a short story? I thought, I miss Rosado. And I think other people miss Rosado. And you know who I really, really miss? I miss the Tonys. So I said, I will be happy and honored, frankly, to write a story. And I called it Pigeon Tony's Last Stand because the set of stories, which is in a little series of other authors too, and they're all terrific. Uh, well, I'm not saying I'm terrific, but you know, they're all really good. Uh, that also sounds bad too, but you know what I'm trying to say. So it's a short story. It stars Pigeon Tony, who gets himself into trouble again, and who's gonna get him out? The Tonys, Maddie D and the other Tonys, Mary D, maybe a little bit of Junie thrown in. I think it's a really fun, it's sweet, it has a, you know, like a like the Rosado stuff. If you say, what's Rosado about? You guys tell me. You guys are, thank you, Anne, love Rosado series. Rosado for me, I love those characters and it feels so real. So for me, above all, it's real. It's about real people in a real city, Philly, South Philly to be exact. And when bad things start to happen in the neighborhood, little Tony, little Tony's my dog, who's named after Pigeon Tony. I got a lot of Tonys on the brain. Pigeon Tony and the other Tonys are gonna step into the fray, even though they're not spring chickens. And if you remember, Pigeon Tony keeps his pigeons and the pigeons are in it too. So all of that good stuff is back. It's a short story. It is not long. It's not novel length. It's about 30,000 words. They're charging a buck 99. That's not a lot of money, in my opinion. You can't, it's cheaper than gum. Um, what I'm saying to you is this, so this is the part I have to tell you. It's an ebook, so you can read it on your Kindle. 
You can order it out. It will be out on February 7th. You know how I remember that date when I remember no other dates? Because February 7th happens to be Francesca's birthday. So if you think about on February 7th that I was in back labor, back labor, which for which I went credit for like 85 million hours, just screaming and yelling all the kind of profanity that you know I'm famous for. This time a book is going to come out. A short story is going to come out. It will be an ebook on Kindle. You can order it whenever you want. Tonight would be great, but no pressure. The other way it's coming out is on audiobook. And this is super cool to me because the audiobook is going to be read by Eduardo Ballerini, who is a god. He is the maestro of audiobook. You know, he says his he says he's narrating. I think he's performing. You might recognize his voice from other, he's a so-called golden voice, which is an elite status of audiobook performers. He's an actor. He was in The Sopranos. He's a brilliant guy. He's a poet. He, he reads T.S. Eliot for audiobook. It's really, really, it's incredible. And so he, you may recognize him though from Eternal. He was the man who read uh, the male parts with the male parts. Don't go there, Lisa. With Cassandra Campbell, who read the female parts, equal time for your little rude joke. Um, he also uh, read Jason Bennett in What Happened to the Bennetts, for which we were nominated for an Audi Voice Award or some such award. Well, we, he, because he did such an amazing job. What I'm trying to say is that I requested him, as in begged him by email, please, Eduardo, read for me Pigeon Tony's Last Stand because these characters are in my heart. I started with them and I started my life in South Philly. And all of these old men are my uncles. They just are. And anybody who listens to them talk knows those cadences, knows the word choice, knows the way they act. There is love in this book, there's crime and there's cheese steaks. There's always gonna be food. And Eduardo does such an amazing, amazing job reading it. So if you win the AirPods Pro, that's what they're called, sorry. Can you read that AirPods Pro? You can listen to Eduardo, read this from Audible. It's like $1.40, it's short. I know you might be disappointed that it's not in a book format, but we have to be real here. I was delighted to accept Amazon's invitation and nobody makes a book out of a short story. It just doesn't work that way, even though it is a Merida. So you can listen to it on audio read by Eduardo, or you can read it on your Kindle or your phone or your iPad or your whatever device you read on. That's everything that's happening. Next week is this. This is up February 7th, but you can pre-order it. Loyalty is coming down the pike. I thought it was great good luck that these kind of look good together. I didn't plan it that way. I don't have that kind of say, control, or knowledge, or organization, which you know. But here we go. Thank you very, very much. I don't think I forgot anything. I think I did everything kind of sort of good. I love you. I appreciate so much your patience with our video. We'll get it together next week. You guys are truly, truly the best. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to you for coming back. I really, really appreciate it. All the dogs are back. So maybe next week we'll have Peach in the Pink. Um, and me too. Thank you very, very, very much. I love you all. Stay safe and healthy till I see you next Monday night. You guys are the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.